Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our webinar, Tips and Techniques, Utilizing the Multispectral Features of a CareStream Molecular Imaging in Vivo MSFX Pro. Our speaker today is Dr. Todd Sasser, who is our Training and Application Specialist here at CareStream Molecular Imaging. If you have any questions during the event, there is a question box to your right. You may fill that out, and we will answer all questions at the end of the event. Thank you very much, and without further ado, may I introduce Dr. Sasser. Thanks, Meryl. Uh, again, welcome to Tips and Techniques, utilizing the multispectral features of a CareStream molecular imaging in vivo multispectral FX Pro system. During this session, we will provide a brief description of multispectral imaging as a general technique. We'll next provide an overview of the in vivo multispectral FX Pro. The primary focus of this session will be to outline a recommended process for optimizing the setup for a multispectral acquisition using a CareStream multispectral system. Here we will follow the recorded process and results for the preliminary imaging and optimization of two fluorophores with overlapping spectrum. This session is intended to be instructional, and the steps demonstrated here could be adapted to any multispectral experimental setup. What is multispectral imaging? In the most general terms, multispectral imaging is imaging that captures data at discrete points across a continuum of a spectrum. The data collected is then used to discriminate a sample, target, or agent based on the unique spectral profile of the sample, target, or agent. Multispectral imaging has applications in biological, geological, space, and military sciences. Multispectral fluorescent imaging for biological applications differs from traditional fluorescent imaging for biological applications in that traditional fluorescent imaging utilizes a single excitation filter and a single emission filter for each fluorophore in the mix. A common traditional fluorescent imaging setup utilizes Psi-3 and Psi-5 for multiplex imaging. These dyes are frequently employed in multiplex applications wherein subsets of DNA or protein are differentially labeled. Psi-3 and Psi-5 have reasonably, have reasonably separate peak excitations and emissions. Their emissions are separated by approximately 100 nanometers. In the example shown here of a dual label western blot, beta-actin was labeled with Psi-3 and ERK was labeled with Psi-5. Psi-3 and Psi-5 were detected in sequence, first with a filter set for Psi-3 and then with the filter set for Psi-5. In contrast to traditional fluorescent imaging, like the example just shown, multispectral imaging utilizes multiple excitation filters and a single emission filter, or a single excitation filter and multiple emission filters. In the in vivo multispectral sample shown here, the fluorophores X691 and X761, which have overlapping spectrums, were administered intramuscularly, each separately in one of the sample's hind limbs. X691 is in the left limb and X761 is in the right limb. The sample was imaged sequentially using 24 excitation filters across the spectrum with a single emission filter. The spectral profiles to the right represent the collection across the 24 filters for X691, X761, skin fluorescence, and gut fluorescence. The spectral profile was then utilized to assign pixels to a spectral category, either X691, X761, skin, or gut fluorescence. This is shown to the right and then to the far right registered with x-ray image. So in the hind limbs, the red and then the blue showing the different displays for the two fluorophores assigned according to their spectral profile. The utility of in vivo multispectral imaging is twofold. Multispectral imaging is used to remove unwanted auto tissue autofluorescence. This allows for an improved signal to noise ratio in the data and therefore an overall improved sensitivity. Multispectral imaging can also allow for multiple molecular detections through the reduction of crosstalk. This provides for the potential to improve experimental design. An example application for this might be combined imaging of fluorescently labeled exogenously administered cells and the imaging of a complementary fluorescent molecular reporter for a host response. One of the considerations for fluorescent imaging that relates to the utility of multispectral imaging is the natural fluorescent properties of in vivo tissue. This figure, taken from current opinion in chemical biology, is a nice visual showing the fluorescent properties of in vivo tissue using green, blue, and then near-infrared filters. There is a high level of tissue autofluorescence using green and blue filters, while there is, the far less, while there is far less using the near-infrared filters. The implication here is that the first utility of multispectral imaging 
i.e., removing unwanted autofluorescence, will apply mostly when utilizing fluorophores in the green, while the second utility of multispectral imaging, i.e., multiplexing, will apply mostly when utilizing multiple fluorophores in the red. Note that for other various reasons, we recommend that fluorophores be that red fluorophores be utilized for in vivo applications when possible, even if using only a single fluor. Here we will use imaging of a green fluorophore to illustrate the first utility of multispectral imaging. Carboxyfluorescein, which has a peak excitation of 492 and emission of 572, was administered both subcutaneously and intramuscularly. The image to the left is a white light image showing the layout of the sample. The image to the right is the multispectral fluorescent image. Here is the same sample set with data analysis. To the left, the sample was imaged using standard single filter excitation and single filter emission imaging. Intensity analysis was performed for both target and non-target regions and was reported as a ratio. To the right, the sample was imaged using multispectral imaging with multiple excitation filters and a single emission filter. Intensity analysis was performed for both target and non-target regions and results were reported as a ratio. Comparing the signal to noise ratios collected for the standard image versus multispectral image, you can see that we have achieved an almost 6x gain in signal to noise with multispectral imaging. This improved signal to noise ratio translates into improved overall sensitivity. Here we will use imaging of two fluorophores, a Lexus 680 and a Lexus 700, in the same sample to illustrate the second utility, i.e. multiplexing of multispectral imaging. Here, Alexa 680 was administered subcutaneously in a dilution series along the right flank of an animal, and Alexa 700 was, um, was administered subcutaneously in a dilution series along the left flank of the animal. The sample was imaged using standard imaging first for Alexa 680 and then for Alexa 700. You will see that there is significant crosstalk in the images, and it is impossible to distinguish the signals. Below, the sample was imaged using multispectral imaging with multiple excitation filters and a single emission filter, and separation of, this, of the signals as possible. The next few slides will detail the hardware of the Multispectral FX Pro. The Multispectral FX Pro is a 4-in-1 instrument that allows for multispectral fluorescent imaging, radioisotopic imaging, luminescence imaging, and X-ray imaging. The multimodal capability of the system provides for combined anatomical and functional imaging. The multispectral system operates on an inverted platform. The sample resides in a sample tray above an imaging window. For fluorescent imaging, filtered light is imported via fiber optics. Detection occurs at a right angle. So again, uh, import of fiber optics from an external illuminator, filtered excitation, and then detection at a right inverted angle. Multispectral fluorescent acquisitions are achieved via automated sequences start that over. Sequential acquisitions at multiple excitation wavelengths. The images are collected and the spectral profiles are modeled and applied. So this is a abbreviated version of a multispectral acquisition. Typically it would be more in the line of uh, 10 excitation filters. Um, as we mentioned before, it is possible to achieve spectral profile profiling using either multiple excitation filters or multiple emission filters. However, the CareStream multispectral systems are designed for excitation profiling. The rationale for this is that most fluorescent probes used in biological applications have inherently more distinct excitation profiles. For radioisotopic detections, a phosphor screen slides between the sample and the detector. The energy is converted to photons for detection. For luminescence detections, the sample is held in a light-tight environment and detection occurs again at an inverted right angle. For X-ray detection, a phosphor screen again slides between the sample and detector. X-ray is applied overhead and the phosphor converts the energy into photons for detection. The in vivo multispectral FX system employs two software packages. The CareStream molecular imaging software drives acquisitions and includes multiple data analysis features. The CareStream multispectral software is employed for post-acquisition modeling of multispectral data sets, unmixing, and image presentation of multispectral data. 
there are three recommended steps for, for performing preliminary optimization for a multispectral setup. The steps are number one, perform multispectral acquisition of a dilution curve of fluorophore in vitro. Number two, generate a spectral model or models for fluorophores. And number three, evaluate the model in vivo. The setup and optimization may be adjusted according to the end user needs. The primary benefit of this preliminary setup is that conditions can be optimized with the benefit of concentrated positive controls. We will follow in detail the process for multispectral acquisitions of the previously noted AlexaFloor 680 and AlexaFloor 700 multiplex application. Alexa 680 and Alexa 700 have closely overlapping spectrums. Alexa 680 is, has a peak excitation and emission of 679 and 702. The, the profile is shown in the graph below as green. Alexa 700 has a peak excitation and emission of 702 and 723 respectively. The profile is shown in blue in the graph below. Step one, um, we'll perform a multispectral ac acquisition of a dilution curve of a fluorophore in vitro. For, the dilution cons for any dilution curve, consider starting with a high concentration that might be relevant to the in vivo experiment. For example, one might use the manufacturer's recommended dose as a starting concentration. If it is a custom probe, you might have other rationale for your starting concentration. In this example, we're going to look at our floors and dilutions from, from two micrograms and then down to 0 0.625 micrograms. The in vivo multispectral FX Pro is configured with 28 excitation filters ranging from 410 nanometers to 760 nanometers. Each filter has a 10 nanometer plus minus bandpass. Filters selected should be based on the profiles of the floor floors being used. We, we recommend referencing the profile provided with the product insert or a web-based tool to assist in selecting the appropriate excitation and emission filters. The view here shows both the complete excitation and emission profiles for Alexa 680 and Alexa 700. The figure here shows just the excitation profiles for Alexa 680 and Alexa 700 with the emission profiles hidden. The red arrows denote the available multispectral FX excitation filters. To generate a functioning model, we will want to select filters that provide points of distinction comparing the two fluorophores. There are several points along the spectrum that differentiate the two profiles. This is denoted by the black uh, hatched arrows. We'll select filters at these locations to include in our multispectral acquisition, so from 520 to 720. So this will provide a good survey across this, these two floor floors where you have differential uh, profiles. Next, we'll select the appropriate emission filter for our acquisition. There are a total of six emission filters that come standard with the multispectral FX. These filters have a 17.5 plus minus nanometer bandpass. Again, we'll reference the profiles for the floor for the floor floors. The available emission filters are shown in red. We can immediately exclude those filters that are not within a reasonable range of the peak emissions of either fluorophore. So this eliminates 535, 600, in this case 700, and then 830. Uh, remember that we did select the 720 nanometer filter as the longest wavelength excitation filter. So we want to consider the band pass and a possible overlap with any of the emission filters. This would potentially overlap with the 750 uh, nanometer emission filter bandpass. So we'll exclude the 750 nanometer emission filter and select the 790 nanometer emission filter for use for this setup. We'll next generate a capture setting as per usual using the Carestream molecular imaging software. The 790 emission filter is selected. Multiple has been selected from the excitation filter pull-down menu. We're provided with a selection box for multiple filters. Here, the desired filters ranging from 520 to 720 have been selected. We select OK. And finally, 
in order to execute a multispectral acquisition, we'll need to generate a protocol with a capture setting included. The software presents uh, files in a format that is compatible with the multispectral software only when acquisitions are run through a protocol. So the protocol view, we've generated a protocol name, and we have below selected our previously defined capture setting uh, for a multispectral acquisition. And then finally, we execute our acquisition. The system provides multiple status indicators as a, proto as a protocol progresses. These indicators include capture step, total duration, and the current filter settings. Okay, now that the acquisition is complete, the data is available, and we'll next generate spectral models. Generating spectral models includes the production of Gaussian curves and subsequent application of the models to data sets and evaluating the models for effectiveness. We first launch the multispectral software. At the welcome panel, we select Open Experiment. We select our protocol folder. And we select any of the protocol XML files in order to launch our data set. Here we get the first view of our data set. The top sample row is the Alexa 680 dilution, and the bottom sample row is the Alexa 700 dilution. We are provided with a white crosshair that reports at per pixel intensity. And the readout is shown below. In the profile below, the x-axis corresponds to the excitation wavelength used, and the y-axis corresponds to the intensity recorded at that wavelength. And we'll want to begin by surveying the data, left to press and drag across the profile to view the individual files in the data set. Position the white crosshair in different regions of the image to survey for spectral profiles, and you can see that as we look at the Alexa 700 versus the Alexa 680, we get a slightly different profile, and we'll be able to utilize that slightly different profile um, to assign pixels uh, accordingly. So we'll next initiate the first spectral model by selecting Add in the Unmixed panel. Here we're provided with a dialog. Uh, the model type um, entered should be, re should reference the acquisition type, and all of the, the models that you use should have a shared model type. Um, and then the model application in this particular setup is 700, uh, indicating that we are creating a model for our, our Alexa floor 700. And so once your model is generated, it will be available for recall in the top menu. Okay, now we have an Alexa Floor 680-700 model tab available, and that's shown here in the unmixed images. Uh, we also have a new view for our profile that includes view, measure, and model. The modeling process occurs in three steps, view, measure, and model. Our zoom pan tool provides us with zoom pan functions. Uh, the view tab provides continued access to survey the image. So I'll just show a quick sequence here. So you can see as I zoom in. With the measure tab, I want to position the red crosshair into a representative pixel for Alexa 700, place the blue crosshairs in the background, and then I begin modeling by positioning the primary curve to the peak of the actual collected data. There are two controls, a whisker and a crosshair. They act differently to control the positionings of the curves, and we'll go over that um, a little bit more detail. So after I've generated the first curve, I next want to move to the next uncovered point in the data set and uh, if needed, I can transition back and forth between multiple curves by selecting the curve button number in the top. Once you have an approximation, select Optimize Curves, and the software will uh, optimize the positioning and the modeling for the curves. 
Okay, so there are a couple of nuances for the curve preparation uh, that should be noted. Number one is that there are two controls for adjusting the curves. And so in the video below, the first control is active when the cursor is positioned near the peak of an active curve. This control shows as a crosshair. This control allows for vertical and horizontal positioning of the curve. The second control is active when positioned at the slope of an active curve. This control shows as a whisker. This control adjusts the slope and width of the curve. And finally, just to remind you um, that the red Gaussian should be adjusted to set the positioning of the green Gaussian uh, so that it matches the actual data. This process should be repeated for the second floor four. So we use the same model type and provide a new model application, which is 680. The model is created as before, and the model is applied by selecting on MEX. So we now have in our panel, if we scroll down, a different view for 680, a different view for 700. We'll position our crosshair into the 680. We'll go from view, measure again the red crosshair into the sample, the blue crosshairs into the background. Select model. Again, we select primary curve. Position our primary curve at the peak of our actual data. And we will in turn make adjustments using the crosshair versus the whisker control and then follow the profile, creating additional Gaussians in order to cover the full data range. And then finally, when we have an approximate, we can select optimize curves and allow the software to optimize the fit. Select on mix. So this will actually apply those models using a nonlinear least squares fit based on our Gaussians. And so you can see that we get quality separation for the two floor fours in this data set. The model will then be evaluated uh, by hiding the views for each. Let me move down one. So by in turn turning off the views for each of the panel, we can look for crosstalk. If we do observe crosstalk, we can reaccess either of the models by using the pinwheel control. So what we would see here in this particular example, we don't see significant crosstalk, but what I would expect is to see, for example, when I turn the green floor off to see some bleed through of the red floor four. And then if I did um, feel that I need to optimize the model further, I would select the pinwheel in the data set. Finally, for step three, we will evaluate the model in vivo. Here we have administered a dilution of the floor subcutaneously. We'll apply our previously generated models and evaluate it for effectiveness. If tissue autofluorescence is observed, we may also choose to improve the setup by modeling tissue fluorescence. We'll make a simple modification of our previously defined protocol by adding a second step for x-ray imaging, since we will be imaging in vivo. We'll access our data as before and access our previously defined models using the Add button in the Unmixed Images panel. So when we select Add, we now have um, a database of previously defined models. We'll select these models in turn, and then we'll select OK. And then finally, we'll select Unmix and evaluate the model as before by turning the two panels on and off to look for crosstalk. Just show this process. Select Unmix. The previous defined models will be applied to this new data set. And there seems to be reasonable separation. There could be some room for improvement of the models. Uh, finally, not necessarily applicable to this particular data set, um, probably more 
applicable to the use of green floor force. Um, we could add a model to separate out any autofluorescence. Um, it makes a minor difference in this particular data set, and you would add the floor um, model, the spectral model, in the same way that we did before. We'd select plus, and then in this case, I've just gone ahead, uh, skipped the process, but you'll see now there's a new panel, and the blue is showing uh, modeling for the autofluorescence. So it would be that same three-step process of positioning the red crosshair into regions of autofluorescence, creating that model, and then applying that model. Okay. So at this point, um, we have all of the experimental setups, acquisition, and modeling available for actual experimental conditions, for use in experimental conditions. So finally, your imaging is complete and you'd like to share uh, and analyze your results. The software includes a couple of options for facilitating this. It includes an export main image button as well as a um, open NMI button for data analysis. I'll just show quickly the sequence here for performing these export options. We select export. This will export any view, any image in the uh, currently open in the multispectral view. So we'll give it a name, a suffix, and then the file will be available for editing um, in third-party package software. Um, if we want to analyze individual elements, um, so in this case the 680 element, we just select open an MI, automatically um, transitions to MI, and from there we can use the data analysis features of MI to perform data analysis. Okay, okay thank you for uh, attending today, and if there are any questions, um, I can field those at this point. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. There is a question box uh, over on your right that if you have any questions, you can type them in. We did get one during the presentation. Is there a maximum or optimum, optimal amount of curves you want to make when creating a spectral model? Um, usually I try to generate a model with as few curves as possible. The reason being is that the more curves that you use, the more computational power that will be required to unmix the sample. Um, typically, the the typical range um, is anywhere from three to maybe five curves at a maximum. More than that, and, and you might observe some delayed processing or application of the model. Okay. Um, another one, if you plan to multiplex two fluorophores with very different peak excitations and emissions, should you still utilize multispectral imaging? Um, as a general rule of thumb, I start to consider multispectral imaging when two fluorophores have peak um, emissions or excitations within about 100 nanometers of each other. But I, what I would recommend doing is uh, attempt using traditional uh, single channel imaging and evaluate for crosstalk. If there's significant crosstalk, um, then certainly apply the multispectral imaging. Okay, that looks like it it for questions. If you have any additional questions, you can always email Todd directly at todd.sasser at carestream.com. Thank you very much. This webinar is being recorded and will be available by the end of the week on our website. Thank you for joining us and have a wonderful afternoon.